This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Today's message is God does not call the worthy. God makes worthy those that God calls. An archbishop in Italy tells the story that there were once four young boys up to no good playing in the street and they dared each other to go in and make a outlandish confession to the priest in the confessional booth. So one of them drew the short straw and went inside and made that confession, which the priest knew was not true. And the priest listened and the priest then said to the young boy, for penance, I want you to go sit in the front pew of the church and look up at the cross, look at Jesus on the cross and say 25 times, I don't care that you died for me. The boy looked up at the cross and immediately ran out of the church. His three friends outside were wondering what had happened and they were laughing and want to know all about it. And this young boy said, I don't want to talk about it. And as the archbishop tells this story, he says, the reason I know this story so well is because that young boy was me. God does not call the worthy. God makes worthy those God calls. God's holiness is revealed to us in so many different ways. Sometimes it's in a church when we least expect it. Sometimes it's out there beyond church walls and the beauty of creation among the people of God. Think of all the ways that you have met the holiness of God. Perhaps some of us are still waiting to experience the holiness of God. And what is the holiness of God? One could say that our culture has lost a sense of the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the very truth that God is holy other, that God is perfect, righteous, set apart, and yet at the same time, the Bible tells us that God longs to connect with us, to be with us, to share that holiness with us. And we have two illustrations of what this can look like from our readings this morning. We have Isaiah in the temple who beholds the holiness of God, and we have Peter the apostle who beholds the holiness of God. Two very different experiences of the holiness of God, yet the same God who is holy and who longs to come to us and to draw us into God's holiness. And so we'll look this morning at how this happens and what happens to us by way of our purpose and our destiny as people made in the image of God and called to engage the holiness of God. Isaiah's in the temple. In the society, there's a lot of disruption and uncertainty. The king has died. The people wonder, where is our destiny going? And suddenly Isaiah, who's in church as it were with everyone else, has this vision where God is revealed as holy, not just holy, but holy, holy, holy. Three times that word occurs because in the Hebrew language, the way to really underscore a point is to say it three times. And there is no other attribute in the Bible when it comes to God that is uttered three times. We don't hear that God is love, love, love. We don't hear that God is mercy, 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 although God is, all those things. But we see that God is holy, holy, holy. This is God's primary recognition among the people of God as we look to God. And how does Isaiah respond? Well, he's overwhelmed. Yes, he's impressed, but he's also realizing that he's about to be utterly destroyed. He realizes how far apart he is from the holiness of God. In this image, God fills the whole temple with God's presence. There are angelic beings worshiping before the throne of God. And as Isaiah realizes he's about to be destroyed in his own imperfection, his own unworthiness in the face of a holy God, what happens? Well, let's look at our culture for a moment. Let's look at ourselves. 
Let's realize that so often we go through our days not even recognizing the holiness of God, the sacredness of life itself, the power of the Almighty who is holy other than us, who dwells in light inaccessible from before time and forever, and yet sees us in our struggles, in our pain, and comes to us. And that's what happens with Isaiah as the angel, as the messenger of God, takes a hot coal and touches his lips, thereby blotting out his sin and his imperfection and transforming him for a purpose. In the blink of an eye, in the moment of forgiveness, Isaiah suddenly says, here am I, send me. He goes from realizing how unworthy he is, as we all are in the face of a holy God, to realizing that, hey, I've got a purpose. I'm forgiven. I'm being given a new start. And we see that God specializes in new starts. That's the heart of the gospel. That through the forgiveness of our sins, by being cleansed by the power of God, we're not only loved and held up, we're actually given a purpose to share the kingdom and the royalty and, yes, the holiness of God with the world. That's incredible news. That's the good news of the gospel. We now go to the Apostle Peter, many years later since the time of Isaiah, and this holy God who filled the temple has come to us in the form of a humble carpenter named Jesus of Nazareth, who the Bible tells us is the visible image of the invisible God. The same God that filled the temple is suddenly incarnated, that is, dwelling bodily in a person, as the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now, it's an ordinary day. Peter, James, and John, the other fisher folk, are on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They would often fish as a team because to use those nets, you needed two different boats. You drag the net and out would come fish, hopefully, but you'd also get a lot of other things like rocks and vegetation, and they'd have to put the nets up and clean them out. It was a lot of work. Fishermen were a rough and tumble sort. It was really not a gentleman's craft. It was a rough life. It could be very lucrative, but it was a tough life. And so these fishermen are on the shore doing what they do. Who knows? Maybe they were cursing, telling jokes, whatever they did. And there's Jesus. And he sees them on the shallowness of the shore, in the shallow waters. And he says, let's go deep together. Because he sees that they've <clears throat> not caught anything all night. But Peter says, okay. So they go out in the boat. He puts the nets in very deep. Have you ever noticed, if you go to a public pool, by the way, all the noise is on the shallow end of the pool. You don't hear a noise coming from the deep end. And so whatever was going on on the shore, suddenly I get the sense that there's a quietude, a stillness. And Peter brings up such a large catch that he has to call his friends over to help. And like Isaiah in the temple, he's beheld something he's never beheld before. And he's convicted of his unworthiness. Isn't that an interesting response? Rather than saying, all right, Jesus, we did it. He says, Lord, just go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Like if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't have done this for me. But Jesus knew exactly who he was and who he would become. Henceforth or from now on, You'll be fishing for people. And so if we look at Peter's life over the next three years, roughly, he was that fisherman we imagined him to be. Impetuous. He was a ready, fire, aim kind of guy. I'm sure in some ways we can all relate to him. As we struggle through life, try to figure out what to do next. We want to do the right thing, but we so often fail. And at the end of Peter's Time with Jesus. Jesus has been crucified. Peter's denied him three times. Like all of us, there's a part of us that deep down we realize 
could look at the cross and say, I don't care what you did for me, Jesus. But we may not say it, but our actions can display it. That the holiness of God is not something we think about as much as we should. And perhaps it's something that we're repelled from. Because we're afraid of what it might show us about ourselves. And so Peter has to look at himself and realize that he's denied Jesus. And yet suddenly something happens. Peter has gone back to his old life of fishing. That's all he knew. Everything's been a disappointment. What he had hoped for in himself and in the life of Jesus with him didn't come to pass. But then suddenly there's this mysterious figure on the shoreline who tells Peter to put the nets on the other side. And Peter brings in a huge catch once again, reminding him of that moment when Jesus first called him. And so as they're back on the shore and Peter realizes it's the Lord, does Jesus say, I've come to destroy you? No. He restores Peter. And not only that, but gives him a new purpose. Rather than fishing for people, he'll now also tend sheep. Jesus takes the failed Peter and he turns him into a shepherd. Something Peter had never done before. Like Isaiah saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Peter, as we see, will become the first bishop of the church. The chief shepherd of the early apostles. Knowing that he was not worthy, as none of us are. And yet God would make him worthy for his purposes. So if we look at our lives today, we might be thinking to ourselves, I believe in the holiness of God. I want to enter the holiness of God. But what does that mean for me to be sent? Does it mean we have to go far away to be faithful to God? Well, perhaps some of us will be sent far away, but many of us will be called to stay right where we are. In the 11th century, there was a Roman emperor named Henry III, King of Bavaria, and he was a very faithful Christian. And he'd grown weary of serving on the throne, and so he went to a local monastery and he said, I want to become a monk. And the abbot said, Your majesty, don't you realize that to become a monk, you have to be obedient? And that's going to be very difficult for you as a king. And he said, that's what I want to do. So the abbot said, very well, this is what you need to do by way of obedience. I want you to go back to your throne and serve in the place that God has placed you in obedience. And Henry did that. And after he died, he was known as the king who learned to rule by learning to be obedient. The call for us is to be the most faithful accountant, teacher, mother, father, caregiver, wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, to exercise faithfulness by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength right where you are, and loving, that is serving your neighbor right next to you. This is cross-shaped living as we are sent by a holy God to be filled with the spirit of God, to show what the holiness of God is like, which Jesus shows us is through service. If you're going weary and where you are right now, thinking you should be somewhere else, trust that God has you right where you're supposed to be. Serve deeply, deeper than ever before, right where you are. Ask the Lord to take you deeper and deeper and deeper in his Holy Spirit which is how we experience the holiness of God most powerfully as we're filled with his Holy Spirit and transformed in Jesus Christ, knowing the forgiveness of sins and the power of what it means to be sent and to be able to say, Lord, here I am, send me. And rather than going far away, it's very likely that God is saying, let's go deeper. God is holy. Be holy as God is holy. 
love God, serve God, and together, just as those fishermen helped each other bring in the nets, we'll continue to serve together and work together, all to the glory of God, which is the beauty of true holiness.